Welcome to the Bakersfield City Council meeting. This television broadcast is brought to you by the local cable companies, the County of Kern and the City of Bakersfield. You can watch the rebroadcast of this meeting Saturday at 7 p.m., Sunday at 10 a.m., and the following Wednesday at 7 p.m. You can download the agenda for this meeting at www.bakersfieldcity.us. Presiding over this evening's meeting, the Honorable Karen Go. It's my pleasure to call to order the 515 meeting of the City Council, May 10th, 2017. Welcome. We're so glad to have all of you here. Madam Clerk, would you please call the roll? Mayor Go. Here. Vice Mayor Smith. I am here. Councilmember Rivera. Councilmember Gonzalez. Here. Councilmember Weir. Here. Councilmember Sullivan. Here. Councilmember Parlier. Here. It's always our pleasure to have our students here, and I think we have Taft College represented. We have Pacific, Fresno Pacific out there, and then Bakersfield College back there. Welcome. And then we have a very special Cub Scout from Krista McAuliffe, and we welcome you, Cole. So thank you so much for being here and learning about uh, how civic life works, and we're delighted to have you here today tonight. And at this time, we're going to ask you to stand for the invocation to be offered by Pastor Saul Gonzalez, Lifehouse Church, Iglesia Casa Vida. And then we'll say, we'll ask you to please remain standing for the Pledge of Allegiance by Colby Sawyer, who's a third grade student at Rio Bravo Greeley Elementary School. So Pastor Saul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, Mrs. Mayor and uh, council members. It, it is a pleasure to be here and, and so what an honor for a council uh, to ask and invoke good God's presence and blessing. Um, if you don't mind, um, a thought just came to me because we're going to be celebrating Mother's Day. And um, there is a young king, because this, this particular uh, presence here in this particular setting reminded me of a, of a tribunal, if you will. There was a young king by the name of Solomon, first time taking, taking the place of a very wise and renowned king, his father David. So the older men around him were, were looking at see what kind of wisdom, what kind of judgment he would have. So one of his cases, he had two women come before him. And in that time, the women just did not have a right to come to a council. And two women of ill repute, if those of you that know a little bit of the Bible. And yet he brought them because he says, I too was very dearly cared for by a mom. And so they both made mistakes. One was a possessive mother overbearing and suffocated the son. Uh, the other one was permissive, too much distance between the son and her. And one took the, the, one, one took the, the child in the middle of the night and they, this became infamous all over. So they finally came to, to Solomon. And so he, asked, he had the, what I'm gonna pray for tonight for everyone in this audience and for this council is Solomonic wisdom the ability to decipher, discern, and decide correctly. Uh, that God would give this council the kind of wisdom that God gave this young king and impressed everyone because he was interested in what was righteous, divinely um, uh, attributing the right judgment. And so he was looking at both stories. The, both moms wanted to be moms again. They had both suffered losses. They both wanted a second chance at being a parent. And so he was very um, sanguine to that. And so he knew that the right mom would not necessarily be the biological mom, but the one that was willing to let it go, the one that was willing to let the baby live regardless. And so he knew that the mom that said, let the baby live, rather than my, me having my own way, what is in the best interest, if you will, of the child? And every parent and every council that looks at what's in the best interest of others is going to enjoy Solomonic wisdom. Let us pray. <clears throat> so, Father, we pray. It is uh, indeed an honor for all of us to just uh, invoke your name. For whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall find refuge and wisdom and direction. And all those uh, needs that we have as human beings, those of us that are in need of direction and wisdom. So I pray for this council. I pray for our fair city that you give this city, Father, the umbrage, the aegisness, the covering, the protection that only you, by way of your angels, can give this city. I pray for our community that is made up of parents that care for our kids, 
schools, uh, our state and county and city agencies. I pray for our first responders. I pray for the weak, for the innocent, for the vulnerable, for the poor, for the indigent, and all those that are working in this community for a better tomorrow. So I pray for this council, I pray for those in attendance, that you would provide us this kind of direction, this kind of protection, this kind of wisdom, Solomonic wisdom. And I pray this in your wonderful name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Miss. Ms. Colby. Thank you. Hello and good evening, Mayor and City Council members. Will you please join me in saying the Pledge of Allegiance? Salute, pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. You, you may be seated. Pastor Saul, thank you so much for all that you do in Oildale. I know you said that uh, you changed the name of your church some time ago because you wanted to bring life to Oildale. Casa Vida, and we thank you for doing that. And Colby, that was so well done. It was beautiful. So thank you very much, and just know that you are free to go whenever uh, you would like to. If you want to stay and join us all night, you're welcome to do that too. Here are a few guidelines to help our meeting run smoothly. We request that you turn off your phones, and in keeping with council policy, council members aren't allowed to send or receive electronic communication during the meeting. We ask that you be courteous in the use of cameras and video. Applause is allowed during the presentation portion of the meeting, but it's not allowed at other times of the meeting. For safety reasons, we ask that uh, no signs be brought into the council chamber. We thank you for your cooperation, and uh, here we go. We'll move forward, and thank you again for being here. Madam Clerk, would you please read the first item? Under presentations, we have a certificate of appreciation to Susie and Jim Marchesini, property owners of 5901 Cedar Falls, Yard of the Quarter Award recipients. Well, here we are again. What a joy it is to uh, hear about your beautiful yard. And in a minute, we are going to see some beautiful photos. And I see that you don't only spend your time in your yard. I got to see you out at Relay for Life serving our community. And we're just so, so very happy for the way that you beautify our community and that you're so conscious of making sure that we can serve water. So it's my honor to present you the Certificate of Appreciation in recognition of 5901 Cedar Falls Drive being named Yard of the Quarter. And we congratulate you for that. And I would love to present you with this. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much so let's take a photo and then you can come back and make some comments. Let's, okay. shall we do that? And do we have multiple? Oh, I thought we did, but um, I don't know where we are. Okay, if we have multiple images, go ahead and move those through our friends in the back. It's beautiful. Come on up here, and would you like to comment on this, Miss Amy, since you're a part of the I'm part, team? I'm part of uh, Keep Bakersfield Beautiful Advisory Board, and uh, my job is to go out into the community and find yards that are beautiful, sustainable, and colorful, and of course with um, drought tolerance in mind, and uh, we're going to keep that subject and I just happened to be I actually took the wrong turn going to visit a friend and I went down the street and there it was I was in the middle of the street I backed up and luckily Jim was out front and he told me about what he had done in his yard and uh, I just thought it was beautiful and I presented it to the um, to the board and here we are so 
I hope to see you again next next time. So, thank you. Make some comments. Well, we appreciate what you've uh, done to recognize the yard. My wife and I worked on it very hard. We immediately decided to change the yard from typical grass and landscaping that you typically see to something more drought tolerant when we were involved with the water curtailments. So when we took this project on, we had a, an idea of our water consumption, but we've, with this yard, um, we've actually reduced our water consumption by about 30%, just the front yard. So it's been a big improvement and we're certainly banking a lot of CFS. So we're very happy with it. And I think everybody else who drives by is happy with it as well. I think it was, great confirmation when Manji stopped by and asked us as well who did our yard and when we told him we did he kind of he kind of paused so it was a good it was a good deal thank you thank you very much thank you and congratulations madam clerk next item please distinguished budget presentation award will be presented to Assistant City Manager Chris Huat, representing the City Manager's Office. So do we like to be in the top 3% of the nation? Is that a good place to be? Seems like it is. And to win an award 17 consecutive years, like every year that we've applied? It's my honor to be able to present the Government Finance Officers Association Distinguished Budget Presentation Award presented to the City of Bakersfield, California for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2016. And it's signed by their executive director. Congratulations and tell us all about this and tell us what you did in that big, beautiful budget. Wonderful, thank you very much. Honorable Mayor, thank you so much, uh, City Council members. The, the award really recognizes the city and the budget document uh, for the current year. Uh, the, the next year's document is in front of you this evening, which we'll go over in just a minute. But what it really recognizes is the readability, the comprehensiveness of that document meeting uh, different standards that the Government Finance Officers Association has uh, for cities, and, and it is a uh, select group that applies for and receives that every year, and we've been very successful in making sure that our budget book complies uh, with the, uh, the different requirements that they have for us, and we look forward to continuing to, to submit that document for that award each and every year. And, and while I have a, a moment, I just want to recognize that the document really is a reflection of, of all of our staff members from the ground up, budget managers, business, business managers, management department heads, our budget team, uh, and, and quickly, there are two staff members in which this was their last uh, budget book that they were going to be working on that are critical to the, the uh, process. One is Caleb Blaschke, a management assistant who'll be moving on uh, here shortly to a, another position and, and outside the city. And he was critical the last three years in putting the document together. And I'd also like to recognize Assistant Finance Director Sandra Jimenez, who puts together a lot of the summaries you see in that book and has been critical for probably most of the 17 years that we've received the award for making sure that those numbers are correct and are in there for you. So just wanted to take a moment to, to recognize those two and thank you so much for, for recognizing us. Thank you. Let's take a picture. Okay. So after you tell us in the presentation that is to come that we have an abundance of money, then we'll consider you for the 18th year. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Presentation of a proclamation to Alan Tandy, City Manager, declaring May 7th through the 13th, 2017, Public Service Recognition Week in Bakersfield. Well, Mr. Tandy, what a joy it is. Here we are, we see people out there cleaning the streets. Does that just happen automatically? We see animals who are taken care of. Wearing Mayoral scarves. Mayoral scarves yesterday. We'll have to, maybe you can tell more about that. We have attorneys who are here looking out for our best interests. We have people here who make sure that 
we have an abundance of money, that, that our finances are well managed. And all of these public employees work so hard together to keep our city where it is, to keep us right there where we can enjoy the quality of life and continue to pursue a very positive quality of life. So it's my honor to be able to present this proclamation, whereas federal, state, county, and city employees serve the American public on a daily basis, having not only undertaken a job, but having pledged an oath to dutifully serve, and whereas police and fire personnel freely put themselves in harm's way to protect the Bakersville community when dangerous situations arise, and whereas city staff depends on the professional expertise of clerical staff to support and enable city government to function, and whereas the city of Bakersfield depends on its employees to assure that streets are clean and kept in good repair and to maintain our water, sewer, and park systems, and whereas public servants Public servants perform physically strenuous work striving to maintain the safety of our citizens and maintain the city's infrastructure, and whereas public servants work to provide an excellent quality of life for Bakersfield's residents. Now, therefore, I, Karen Go, Mayor of the City of Bakersfield, do hereby proclaim May 7th through 13th, 2017, as Public Service Recognition Week in our city, and with this proclamation, express the appreciation of the Mayor and the City Council to our dedicated employees for the outstanding service they provide in the City of Bakersfield and its citizens on a daily basis. It's dated at Bakersfield, California, this 10th day of May. Thank you so much, Mr. Tandy, and your team. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. Uh, we're very fortunate to have marvelous employees with the City of Bakersfield, uh, and along with our award-winning budget, on Roman numeral 35, you will find a piece about the City's Employee Incentive Team. Uh, the mission of this employee incentive team is to promote the recognition of employees' excellence, to foster a positive work environment uh, that values every employee, to encourage creativity and innovation, to act as a conduit for enhancing citywide networking opportunities, and to foster public uh, positive relationships utilizing a citywide team philosophy. Uh, they created Spirit Week this week. There were some of our shelter adoptables. Uh, wearing uh, pretend uh, Mayor Go scarves. Uh, <laughs> and uh, uh, today uh, was Blue and Gold Day. Tomorrow, I think, is uh, where things that pertain to your favorite team uh, day. And on Friday, of course, we have our annual employee and breakfast when members of the elected body and department heads and my office and myself will be uh, serving breakfast to employees. So we appreciate the employee incentive team and all our employees, and thank you for the recognition. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Presentation of a proclamation to David Lyman, Visit Bakersfield Manager, declaring May 7th through the 13th, 2017, Travel and Tourism Week in Bakersfield. Come on up here. We have a great team here. Council members, how many of you would agree that Bakersfield is a great city? Would you agree on, with me on that? Yes. And we want to encourage people to visit our great community. And we have the honor of having a fine team here that does that. And they encourage tourism that brings in lots of good people and uh, economic development that we like, the money. And so uh, we'll, we'll be hearing from them, but it is my honor now, come on, step forward, uh, to proclaim. Whereas National Travel and Tourism Week, now in its 34th year, is the annual salute to travel in America, and whereas the travel industry is an indispensable source of American jobs, jobs that cannot be outsourced, and whereas the travel industry supports 15.1 million American workers, 8.2 million directly and 6.9 million indirectly, and in Kern County, the travel industry supports more than 15,000 jobs, and whereas annual travel spending in Kern County exceeds 1.3 billion, generates 380 
88 million in earnings and generates more than 30 million in local tax revenues alone. And whereas the city of Bakersfield and the greater Bakersfield Convention and Visitors Bureau have had a long, successful, and productive partnership over many years, and whereas the city of Bakersfield runs its day-to-day -day operations to bring conventions, events, and visitors to Bakersfield, and whereas the city visit Bakersfield's division relies upon this partnership with the CVB to create and retain jobs, support locally owned businesses, and generate tax revenues by helping people to spend their money in Bakersfield. Now, therefore, I, Karen Go, Mayor of the City of Bakersfield, do hereby proclaim May 7th through 13th, 2017 as Travel and Tourism Week in our community and encourage all citizens to appreciate the contributions of tourism to our great community. It's dated at Bakersfield, California, this 10th day of May, 2017. And may I present this to Mr. Lyman. Thank you. Thank you very, Thank very you. much. And <laughs> Ms. Gatlin, come on up here and share some comments. Marigo, City Council members, my name is Jenny Gatlin. I'm the general manager of the Courtyard by Marriott here in Bakersfield. I'm a past chair that sat or currently sits on the board of directors for the CBB. Uh, both our chair and vice chair this evening weren't able to join us. They had previous commitments, so I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Uh, travel and tourism play an important part in our local economy. Visitors spend money, visitors generate tax revenue, and they also help to create and retain jobs. Our board has partnered with the City of Bakersfield for many years, which I've sat on the board, and I'm very honored. Our, uh, both our organizations are focused on bringing groups, events, and the individual traver, traveler to the city. Our board looks forward to continuing our work with the City of Bakersfield, and thank you for recognizing the benefits that travel and tourism bring to the area. Thank you. Mayor, thank you. Council, I'm David Lyman with Visit Bakersfield. What you see here is a successful partnership. Two organizations working together towards a common goal, which is to recognize the benefits of travel and tourism in our community. This current arrangement has been successful for the past 10 years. In fact, it's been so successful that you recently voted to extend it for an additional 10 years. The CVB board provides us at the staff level with valued insights and counsel. So on behalf of the Visit Bakersfield staff and everyone at the City of Bakersfield, let me personally thank the CVB Board Directors for their continued partnership, and we look forward to working together to promote travel and tourism in our community. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Public statements. At this time, we'll receive public statements. All statements are given a three minute time limit, 15 minutes per topic. If you would like to make a statement tonight, please come forward to the front row so that we can move through this. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give them to the clerk and she'll give copies to the council. Please avoid any behavior that disrupts the meeting. We're very interested and concerned with your issues, but due to the public notice requirements of the Brown Act, the council can't take action when an item isn't on the agenda. The council can, however, refer your matter to committee or request that staff contact you. Madam Clerk, would you please call the first public speaker? We have three speakers this evening, and uh, all three are speaking on separate subjects. Our first speaker is Mona Sidhu regarding hate crimes. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Good evening, my name is Mona Sidhu, and I'm back here again talking about hate crimes. I will be uh, providing packets to all members of the uh, City Council at a later date, sometime later this week. I went to the Safe Neighborhoods Committee meeting last um, couple of weeks ago, I think it was, 
um, and provided partial information to the city uh, council members who were there, but I'd like to provide a more complete set of information since three minutes is not enough to go over everything. My concern is a hate crime prosecution that happened in the, in the county last year uh, and the resolution of that case. When it happened, I decided to take a measured approach instead of going to the press with my concerns because I did not want the parties involved to get defensive. I was looking for an opportunity for us to change what, to make some positive changes so that what happened that time would not happen again. I was also concerned that some of the facts that I would have to relay would cause alarm in the community because of the way the case was handled. In brief, there was a misdemeanor prosecution the perpetrator was charged with a hate crime and a battery. As his penalty, he was not required to do any community service, any anger management, and time and effort was spent assuring him, reassuring him, that his Second Amendment rights would not be affected by his conviction. That creates a, not a very secure feeling in members of minority communities that are subject to hate crimes. The least that we can expect is that if our sense of security and peace of mind is violated by a hate crime, even if no physical uh, violence occurs or no physical injury occurs, but where death threats are alleged to have been made, that the very least we should be able to expect is that our government will take the case seriously enough to not just charge it, but when they charge it and resolve it, that they will take measures to make sure that something like that um, is, is not just treated so lightly, with no community service, no apology, no anger management, but a reassurance that the person can keep their guns. Um, that's very disturbing. I started by dealing with the county on this issue because prosecutions are conducted by the county district attorney's office, but I'm here because the crime occurred in Bakersfield, and I think all elected officials should um, chime in on this issue, whether they agree with me or not. Um, I will be submitting packets to the Board of Supervisors and to you about what happened in court and how the matter was eventually resolved. And if you think I'm out of line, there's the old circular file that the packet can go into. But if you think that there should have been something more done, that we should not set a precedent for this kind of resolution for this kind of crime in the future, then I would ask you to take whatever action you think is appropriate. Thank you, Mr. Dew. Madam Clerk, next speaker, please. Terry Maxwell regarding the budget. Welcome. Please introduce yourself. Terry Maxwell. I'm a resident of Ward 2. Uh, thank you for the opportunity tonight. Uh, I wanted to give you a couple of quotes to start with. Uh, one is from John Adams. There are two ways to conquer and enslave a nation. One is by the sword. The other is by debt. And then the second one, I believe, is either uh, J. Paul Getty or uh, um, Warren Buffett. When everyone is thinking the same thing, then no one is thinking. Um, I want to talk to you about the budget tonight. Uh, there wasn't a lot of information that was in the packet for the public, uh, so I'm not sure what's going to be presented. But there were a couple of things on the agenda tonight that I think that uh, is very telling, and hopefully the presentation that you get later will be pretty comprehensive, because I know that uh, it's going to be a real, real um, challenge for the future. Uh, I noticed that there is a change order on Rosedale uh, project, uh, and this means that the, uh, you're at 20.9% over the original contract price. Uh, that's pretty scary when you consider what would happen if Centennial Corridor was 20% over budget. So um, hopefully we're paying attention there. Now, Budget and Finance Committee, is going to ask to be, have their, um, ap their action plan adopted for 1718, the year 1718. Now they're using uh, CDBG funds and adding three community relations officers for the police department. Uh, not sworn law enforcement officers like we were told. Uh, and mostly in Ward 1, not in Ward 2, uh, like we were also told. Uh, the, one, the, the one area for Ward 2 is going to be in Baker, not downtown, like we're told. Uh, and it's not happening until the spring of 2018, so I'm not sure what kind of impact that's going to have today when that's not 
that's a year from now. The council has been told many times that when the Hageman flyover is at 90% of final design, that they would start acquiring properties. Um, I noticed that in the memo from the uh, city manager, you're at 95%. It looks like you're all, all you're doing is a bunch of administrative things. You have not acquired any properties at this point, and it doesn't look like you're even having anybody going out and looking to see what that's going to cost. Um, and I, I have heard other stories, but they're secondhand, so I'm not going to embellish them. Um, now, on the other hand, on 24th Street, do you realize you're only at 65% final design? You've been there for almost two years. You acquired those properties almost two years ago, and they've sat there. So quite frankly, even with, without the litigation that has gone on, if you're only at 65% final design, I'm not sure why we even bought those properties in the first place. Um, and uh, I guess I'm wondering why, why there isn't anybody on the council that isn't asking the question as to why we're stuck at that 65% design. Mr. Uh, I can venture, uh, I can venture a guess. I still have some time. Uh, you're actually over by 20 seconds. Okay, I'll be done in just a second. The key, the key to, to where they're at is liability, and I hope everybody takes time to, to, to look at that liability. I have uh, neighbors in the neighborhood that uh, have been approached by people from the city uh, and talked about a design that is already there. I'm not sure how that happens when you don't have your design completed, and that... Uh, uh, that Mr. Once these houses are torn down, that they're supposed to have sound walls put up. And again, I'm not sure how that happens. Thank, Thank you. you. Madam Clerk, next speaker, please. Jack Becker regarding bike month in May. Welcome. Welcome. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Council members. My name is Jack Becker. I'm the new programs manager with Bike Bakersfield, and I would like to let you all know that May is bike month. We still have some more events going on in May that I'd like to inform you about. On Saturday, we're going to have a art trek ride. Um, it's going to start at Cafe Smitten at 10 and return there. It's going to be about an hour long, nice easy pace throughout the city to look at the murals, the uh, painted utility boxes, and some of the sculptures around town. Also on Saturday, at the Craft Beer Festival, we're going to have bike parking that's free for people that are attending the event. May 17th is the Ride of Silence. It's a bike ride to honor those that have fallen while commuting or riding their bikes on the streets. Um, it's a silent ride, and so we'd like to have people honor the rules of the road and wear, wear helmets to that event. Um, so that's May 17th from 7 to 8. We're going to meet at the Marketplace Fountain, and that's the same place the ride's going to end. And then May 19th is National Bike to Work Day. I would invite you all to ride your bikes to work and join us in that event. And then after work, um, we're going to be holding a pub ride that goes from 4.30 to 7.00. We're starting at the green room at 4.30, and then going to move to imbibe and then to lengthwise at the marketplace. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Becker. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Under workshops, we have the fiscal year 2017-2018 proposed budget overview. Mr. Tandy. I just walked in the door, I'm sorry. I didn't know you were supposed to fill out a card before you speak to the council. Could I have a moment? Okay. Go ahead and speak, uh, fill out the card and then... Can you fill out the, the card, card first? We can fill it out later. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Okay. Uh, my name is Nathan Nimnick, and I am here to offer the city of Bakersfield $300 million over the next five years, and between one and $300 million for each year after that that the city can use to lower its tax burden. 
This offer also includes additional funds for the creation of an organization dedicated to improving our local economy by creating jobs, lowering the crime rate, helping to get the homeless off the street, and in general, providing a better economy for, the, for our uh, city. For those of you that I haven't met yet, uh, I was one of the 25 people that ran for mayor last time. Ever since November, I've been trying to get a meeting with this board. Well, I've been shuffled around from place to place, so this is my last resort. Um, <clears throat> basically, I've been running up against the thing that politicians like to call plausible, plausible deniability, and uh, for whatever reason that is, I don't understand. But uh, all I'm trying to do is make Bakersfield a better place to live. And what I'm planning and uh, what I would like to do is sit down with this board and discuss what I have, uh, what I can do for the city. And if I could have just an hour of your time sometime in the future, I'd appreciate it. Thank you very much. Go ahead and um, the clerk will be happy to give you a form to fill out. And I think we have one more uh, who's here and again being the first time not knowing to fill out the card. Yes, I'm sorry, I did not fill out a card. Go ahead and identify yourself and uh, proceed. Uh, my name is Carrie Heilman. I am the new executive director of the Bakersfield Symphony Orchestra. And I just wanted to take a moment tonight and thank you very much for your continued support of our wonderful symphony. Uh, we are just finishing our 85th season this Saturday, which um, is a huge um, honor to be able to be here for 85 years. Also, uh, we wanted to let you know that our youth outreach has taken off and uh, we now have 12,000 students that come to our young people's concerts every year. And also through our BSO Next program, we have 2,000 students that have been given sponsored tickets to attend just our regular symphony concerts, which is a huge accomplishment. And um, having a symphony in residence here says something about our community. And I thank you very much for sharing that vision. Thank you. Thank you very much. We are so fortunate to have a professional symphony orchestra in our community. So I encourage all of you, if you haven't been, come and visit the symphony. Madam Clerk, I think you've already read the next item, but since we took it out of sequence, do you want to just go ahead and read it again? Certainly, Mayor. Fiscal year 2017-2018 proposed budget overview. Thank you. Mr. Tandy? Honorable Mayor and members of City Council, the City Charter uh, directs that my office prepare a proposed budget for your consideration. We're here tonight to kick off that process with an overview of the entire budget. Um, during the regular meetings in May and June, you'll be doing a number of budget-related actions, public hearings, uh, notices, uh, other statutory requirements, and on two Mondays, uh, for half days, May 29th and June 5th, you have scheduled workshops where various departments and certain division heads will be making presentations to the city council about what is contained in the draft budget. Um, the uh, budget for the last number of years uh, team has been spearheaded by Assistant City Manager Chris Hewitt. Uh, he and Finance Director Nelson Smith will uh, convey to you the essence of tonight's message. And I, I uh, like to start with the conclusion, and that is that our budget team consists of a number of people, including the two just referenced, Assistant Finance Director Sandra Jimenez, Accounting Supervisor Randy McKeegan, Assistant City Manager Steve Tellia, Management Assistant Caleb Bloschke, Assistant Police Chief Greg Terry, Assistant Public Works Director Ted Wright, and Human Resources Manager Lisa McGranahan. In addition, it includes every department head, every business manager, and a vast number of employees uh, in the city of Bakersfield who work cooperatively to bring this rather complex document before you. And finally, I would like to thank the Mayor and City Council for the fiscal prudence you have demonstrated long term in Bakersfield's history, which is what uh, keeps us solvent uh, and not as uh, affluent as we would like to be, but uh, not threatened or endangering uh, by uh, threats of bankruptcy or f fiscal problems either. Uh, with that, I'll introduce Chris Hewitt. Thank you, Mr. Tandy. You thanked everybody else, and we uh, thank you so much for your leadership. Good evening once again, Honorable Mayor, City Council Members, Chris Hewitt, City Manager's Office. 
I'm going to go through a few slides for you uh, regarding the upcoming fiscal year's proposed budget. I'm going to start off with an overview, talking about some high-level trends and factors, and then go into the detail a little bit more here in just a moment. Uh, we're developing this budget in, in an evolving environment. We have changes at the local level, at the state level, and at the federal level that we know today will be impacting this document as it's proposed to you. At the local level, uh, we've talked about over the past few years uh, the oil industry. I'll touch upon that in, in a minute. That then leads uh, to sales tax fluctuations from a quarter to quarter basis. We also are looking at development activity trends as well to kind of gauge the, the health of the local economy. At the state level, again, a reoccurring topic that we brought before you is CalPERS and changes at, at their level in, in Sacramento that trickle down to cities across the state and Bakersfield's not immune to that as it relates to employer paid rates. Uh, we also have some transportation funding that was recently enacted by the state that I'll get into a little bit, which is a, a positive in the sense that there, there's funding uh, coming to the city in future years for uh, local streets. At the federal level, uh, it's a little bit more of an involved process, uh, but there has been some proposals thrown out that would eliminate portions of the CDBG and home program as well as uh, eliminate the COPS funding. And again, I'll, I'll go into that in just a moment. So what you're going to see tonight is no general, significant general fund expenditure increases outside of the, the CalPERS cost. That's what's really driving any percentage increases that you're seeing in, in the departments, which I'll, I'll go over in just a moment. We are proposing four new positions. Those are funded with non-general fund revenues, either special revenue funds or enterprise funds. There's no cost of living adjustments included in the budget before you. There's no significant increases in any of our general fund programs or services. As you recall, we've seen some reductions over the last two fiscal years that have really impacted service levels uh, out in the field. Uh, unfortunately, we aren't really able to, to restore a lot of those in this budget. Uh, I am, at least at this point in time, happy to tell you that there aren't further significant reductions. Our capital program is relatively flat. We're gonna, you're going to see a little bit of an increase, and that just has to do with the timing of some federal earmarks being budgeted for the Thomas Rhodes Improvement Project. Again, that's a year-to-year -year type of thing. So that's really the fluctuation that you'll see there. At the local level, we, we continue to see mixed signals across the board in various areas. Our oil industry indicators are a mixed bag over the last 12 months. We've seen a couple of our indicators that we look at trend positive. The price per barrel of oil is up to about $45, $48 a barrel. And that's been steady probably for the last six or seven months. We've seen our active rig count in the county uh, increase from two to, that it was stagnant at two for, for many, many months to six. So we're up four in that time period, which is a, an indicator of production and, and investment in the, the oil fields. Unfortunately, we still have not seen a rebound in employment in the oil sector. It was at a high in 2014 of around of 13,000, a little over 13,000. We're, we're still at about 8,900. Uh, employed in the sector countywide. So the thousand that I show here is, is really what's occurred over that last 12 months. So again, in the oil sector, we're just not seeing any definitive trends. We're, we're seeing some positive, some negative. It's really just all in flux right now. We, we still see producers and those in the industry remaining cautious, especially on the hiring front locally. Development activity is a slightly different story. We're, seeing, we're, we're continuing to see stable numbers. Uh, I have some st stats up here for you. Uh, in the calendar year to date, we've seen 426 uh, single family home permits pulled as compared to 430 through the same time period last year, so relatively stable. Solar permitting uh, over the past few years has, has been a category that has steadily increased. Uh, we're, we're seeing it lag a little bit right now through, through the current uh, time period through the end of last month, uh, down about 400 or so permits. I talked about sales tax. You're, you're familiar with the trends. The second and third quarter, 16, we saw around negative 10% when you compare it to the same quarter in the previous year. The fourth quarter was good news in our eyes in the sense that it was positive. It was positive 1%. Uh, the first quarter of 2017 numbers will be available in just about a month, uh, and we'll know kind of where we, we sit uh, there. In regards to kind of digging through the sales tax a little bit more, we provide you each quarter with monthly reports on, on, the, sale, or on the quarterly reports regarding the categories in which make up our total sales tax revenue. It's no surprise that oil equipment sales and service category has continued to dip. 
department stores are, are showing some negative trending. On the flip side, new and used vehicle sales uh, are showing some positive signs during the fourth quarter, uh, which, is, which is good. Unfortunately, it's, it's similar to, to the last slide in the sense that the ind indicators we're seeing here are volatile and quarter to quarter, it's difficult to, to predict uh, what is occurring. At the state level in late April, uh, there was a package of transportation funding that was signed by the governor. It in part uh, is going to generate new revenue through new taxes and registration fees and, and that revenue in part will be going to cities on a formula basis. So 17-18 will be the first year that the city starts to see funding from those sources. Be about $2.6 million is what they're estimating for us right now. Again, that's a partial year funding. Part of the, the revenues don't kick in until November of 2017 and then some kick in later in future years. In 18-19, that same funding source is, is uh, supposedly going to be allocating an estimated $6.9 million to the city. That uh, transportation legislation is good for, for a period of 10 years, or so the revenue sources that were enacted are good for 10 years. And in that 10-year period, we've seen an annual estimates on average for the 10 years of about $8 million. So it takes a little bit to ramp up, and then over the period of those, those 10 years, we'll have uh, an average of $8 million estimated. This is not funding that's able to be used to supplant any of our local street funding or historical funding. We have, there's, a, there's a maintenance of effort posi uh, provision in that legislation, so we, we have to keep, uh, this is additional or supplemental to, to what we uh, have historically done. And again, this new revenue goes into, new revenues will go into effect in, in later in 2017. So we don't have any of these new dollars programmed within this budget document today. Uh, in part because there are certain guidelines, reporting requirements, and budgeting requirements that are still being vetted uh, out a little bit on the administrative level. So we're waiting for the dust to settle a little bit. Uh, and, and again, those revenues won't start to come into November. So we will uh, have a better uh, grasp on, on the program and, and what's needed from a documentation standpoint. And we'll be bringing you those documents during your mid-year budget uh, update probably in January. As I've talked about previously, CalPERS has continued to revise its investment projections and made changes to the employer rate structure, which directly affects how much the city must contribute to CalPERS. Uh, in next year, we're looking at a $2.4 million increase. That jumps up in 1819 based upon the estimates that we have from CalPERS with the information that we have today to 6.5 million above and beyond uh, what, what the city is currently contributing. Cost increases, uh, these cost increases are, are creating a significant challenge uh, to the general fund and to the city as a whole. Uh, we do have other needs and uh, these dollars are being allocated to CalPERS where, where you know, obviously there's an opportunity cost there. Uh, they, these increases are reflected in the departmental budgets that you're gonna be seeing over the next uh, few weeks and, and again uh, are the reason why we're, we're showing some, some increases. Staff has also budgeted about a half a million dollars in, in uh, the non-departmental budget for future anticipated increases. We've done this in past years where we've set aside some, some revenue uh, in the budget for uh, future increases to mitigate in part uh, the, the next budget cycle. I've showed you this slide previously. This shows you uh, the past three years of actual CalPERS payments. And then what we've done is project out uh, for the next several years what we estimate CalPERS payments uh, to be from the city. And we've done those for, for do two different schedules. I think the revised earnings estimate is at 7%. Uh, so uh, the red line is really where we believe we are, are going to be paying out for the next uh, several years. And again, this is absent any changes that CalPERS may or may not make uh, in the future that, that uh, readjusts the, the city's payments. At the federal level, uh, I'm sure you've have seen that the president's blueprint or the preliminary document that's provided by the White House included the elimination of the community development block grant program, the ho home program, and the COPS grant. So for a combined uh, CDBG and home program, the city receives about $4.3 million annually. And uh, wholly that those, those funds uh, provide programs and services and infrastructure to low and moderate income 
residents of the city as well as support eight uh, in, in whole or in part eight full or full time positions. The other program that was proposed to be uh, eliminated, at least initially, was the COPS grant program. We have utilized that grant program in the past, the tune of $7 million over three grant cycles since 2003, and that has paid for sworn officers uh, over that period of time. So uh, two significant programs that there has been discussion about. You also have seen that the federal government recently uh, passed and enacted the, the spending bill for the remainder of the, the current fiscal year, which did keep these programs intact. However, the new federal fiscal year starts in, in October, uh, and there will be discussions that uh, take place between now and then that may alter uh, these programs, and, and we are going to be keeping a close eye on them. So our major revenue projections going into next year, we're projecting sales tax, or excuse me, uh, property tax at a 5% uh, increase, and that's based on discussions that we have with the county assessor's office. Not anticipating any growth in our sales tax, again, just due to the various fluctuations we've seen in those categories and activity across the city that I was talking about. Uh, permitting revenues on the development side, we are looking at a slight increase, and we are projecting no growth in our transient occupancy tax or our hotel tax going into next year. A little bit about the staffing changes. Uh, we are proposing those four positions. Uh, three police, sworn police officer positions are proposed to be added through the Community Development Block Grant Program, which I, I just mentioned. Uh, those officers are recommended to be focused on the downtown area. We are also proposing to add a solid waste equipment operator. That's a position that's funded through the Refuse Fund. Uh, not the general fund, and that's really in response to the increase in the residential homes that have been constructed since 1415, which is the last time that we've added a driver and a route to go to go collect that, that refuse. Uh, this will alleviate using some of our green waste facility staff members and some overtime, uh, and again, to, to better serve those neighborhoods. We are not proposing any other staffing additions or deletions at this time, so that, that is the uh, that is it for, for the proposal as it stands right now, the four positions. I'd like to give you a little bit of history here as we do every year. The proposed full-time complement for next year is at 1525. If you rewind and go back to 2008, 2009, you see we were at 1613, or about 88 positions uh, more than we are today. So we are, are still uh, behind or below the level of full-time staff that we had. Uh, just prior to the recession. We'd just like to provide some context for you. Regarding fee and rate adjustments, uh, we are proposing a, a few rate adjustments, and I'll go through each one of those. For refuse rates, uh, we are proposing a 2% increase from $195.72 to $200 annually, and that is due to some increased costs associated with the operation. We are proposing those changes through a public hearing that will be before you in, in June. On the sewer side of things, not proposing any rate increases. Uh, there is a component of our commercial uh, sewer program. It's called the surcharge component. Uh, in 2014, the council approved a five-year phase-in of some new surcharge rates, and so we're in year four or five of that program. That, that roughly impacts about half of the 4,000, a little more than half of the 4,000 commercial uh, sewer uh, users throughout the city. And again, we have a hearing for that component uh, on, on June 7th. Not proposing initially any changes to our domestic water rates. However, there are some state, man ma state mandated, excuse me, regulations that are in the pipeline and uh, are likely to be enacted here in the, in the very near future, which are going to require some significant investment by the city to comply with those mandates as it relates to, to TCP and, and, uh, and that component. So that will likely mean a rate increase will need to occur, but it will likely be towards the, the fall or later in 2017 when we have some more clarity uh, on, on those costs. There, there, there are a few things at play there. Regarding the master fee schedule, we, uh, over the course of, of several years here, have only incrementally raised fees by, say, a 2% or, or so ca uh, percentage. We have not really had a full update since 2008, and in some cases, some, some fees have not been updated uh, since 2005. So we are going through a process of evaluating uh, a full cost recovery program and those increases. We did build in those revenues into the, the 
next year's budget, and that equates to about a $435,000 increase in, in those various revenue line items. So again, that will be before you in an upcoming meeting, and, and the purpose of that, again, is to, to uh, bring those fees closer to full cost recovery than they have been in the, in the near past, and, and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll move forward from there. In regards to equipment and some other miscellaneous items, a note that are included in the budget, our fleet services division will be replacing or is scheduled to replace about $7.5 million of equipment that's reached the, its end of life. Fleet services goes through a pretty extensive review of all the equipment that's due for replacement. In past years, we've had to defer some equipment, um, but uh, we're, we're proposing to replace about $7.5 million. Our, Technology Services now, excuse me, I, I, I uh, didn't list it correctly. Our Technology Services Division is scheduled to replace nearly $1.3 million in deferred or obsolete computer equipment. A majority of that's going to be next door at the police department uh, for MDCs and for workstations within the various offices. Uh, the retiree health care annual requirement is fully funded for next year at $5.7 million have a council contingency of $25,000 budgeted. The spay and neuter voucher program uh, is going to be funded once again at $40,000, and we're, we're doing the $40 vouchers. That's been very successful. And finally, as the speaker mentioned earlier uh, this evening, uh, staff is proposing the continued contribution to the symphony and the Beale Park Band in the amount of $37,000. A little bit about our capital improvement program. I'm gonna go over some of the highlights our public works department and other departments will go into more detail during their department presentations regarding their specific projects. Again, these are, are generally one-time revenues that are used for capital projects. Focus continues to remain on the, the Thomas Rose Improvement Program. Your, the, the commitment that the council has made to non-trip road funding, which I'll get into in just a minute, park enhancement and expansion, uh, deferred facility maintenance, and public, public safety facilities. Regards to the TRIP program, there is about $36.6 million budgeted for the next phases of the Centennial Corridor. That includes some federal earmark and local dollars, and it also includes money for local road and sewer packages. The Truxton Avenue Operational Improvement Project, as you recall, we received some federal funding for that. That's included in the budget. That will make improvements to the Truxton and Oak area and that intersection. And then the Brighton Park sound wall, which I think you, most of you are, are familiar with, that is also budgeted uh, for next year. Have some non-trip projects that are federally funded, some large rehabilitation projects. I've listed three here. I think there are five or six that, that will be in your document. Uh, A Street, Auburn Street, and White Lane for, for those areas will be rehabilitated. As I mentioned, the, the council continues to make it a priority to ensure that we have funding uh, every year for local roads. I'm pleased to report that in next year's budget, we're proposing $23.9 million total from all funds to local roads. Uh, again, that's made up of the funds here and the amounts. Uh, that is slightly more than in the current year, uh, and, that, and so that, uh, that is positive, about a million or so dollars more. And that doesn't take into consideration to the legislation that I talked about earlier in regards to uh, the new state funding, which is anticipated to, to again come online later this year. About a million and a half dollars in CDBG funded curb gutter and sidewalk projects in these various areas. And some bike lane installation uh, around the Bakersfield College area. Park projects that we have in the budget total about $2.1 million. And, and you can see here, those are broken down. Sports Village, Mason Marin, and a shade and accessibility improvement project for Jastrow Park. In the CDBG fund, we have two park projects to improve accessibility and add some shade structures at Stern and, and Lowell Parks. For our public safety facilities, we have a few projects that are proposed. One is a locker room and bathroom rehabilitation at fire station number two. Fire station number two is the oldest fire station operated by the city. The bathroom and, and locker room areas are about 30 years old or so uh, in need of upgraded improvement. The police department, if you recall a few years ago, uh, we had to remove some funding for the pistol range upgrade and enhancement project. We have proposed to uh, fund about a million dollars or a little over a million dollars to make some upgrades at the pistol range 
uh, just west of Truxton, or just west of Oak on Truxton, as well as an expansion of the parking lot out at the west side substation due to an increase in staffing and utilization of that facility. Keep going backwards. And just some other miscellaneous projects of note at the parking garage, we're proposing to upgrade uh, the I Street entrance at the garage. Right now it's only available to monthly parkers and uh, now with the new signs and the other enhancements that have been made, uh, we, we uh, are proposing to upgrade that. So that's it would be an all access uh, monthly and hourly gate. Elevator replacement as well. The elevator is, is many years old at that facility and is proposing to replace that. Down at the arena, the video board, the center hung scoreboard has four video boards on it. Those video boards are obsolete and starting to get pixels that are going black and, and not being able to be repaired or replaced immediately. It's older technology and so there's the replacement parts are, are becoming more difficult to come by. So posing to replace those with LED screens, it'll enhance the user experience down there at the arena. The ice chiller replacement, that's a, a significant component within the, the facility for all ice type events and, and that infrastructure is, is becoming more uh, obsolete as well. Over at the community development building, uh, some years ago the council appropriated some funding to upgrade the lobby and provide again a better experience for staff and for those that come in to utilize that building for permitting and, and planning purposes. Uh, the one remnant that wasn't able to be funded due to some budget cuts was the completion of a conference room that, that staff uh, really needs on the first level uh, to again provide a better customer experience. So we're proposing about $25,000 for that. And then out at the Animal Care Center, the last remaining kennel uh, that wasn't uh, redone when the city took over that facility is proposed to be uh, re-epoxied. Okay. I'm going to get into some numbers, starting with the big picture and then talking about the general fund, and then I will wrap up. Looking at next year's budget, when you combine both the total operating budget for all funds and the capital budget, the, the total budget is $494.3 million, or that's reflective of about a 7.2% increase. A lot of that increase you see, again, is in the capital side of things, but again, that has to do more with the timing of federal funds that are being programmed for the TRIP program as opposed to, to any other significant deviation in the capital program. So a lot of what you're seeing is, again, that the timing of those funds being appropriated next year. When you look at the resources by type, you can see here uh, how those compare. Again, you see the intergovernmental and enterprise line item. That's where that, that, those dollars I was talking about are accounted for. Uh, again. Uh, when you look at, at the total, about a, a $30 million difference or so. This gives you an idea of the revenue sources and, and the percentages in, in which uh, it's made up. Our charges for service and our taxes and assessment category uh, make up the lion's share of the revenue sources for all funds within the city. Taking those revenues and then appropriating them, and this uh, shows you all funds, including capital dollars, how those funds are proposed to be appropriated, about $128 million total uh, to the public safety groups. Public works at $184 million. Again, those are, are including capital projects in which public works oversees the lion's share of, of those projects. And then you can, you can see from there each other uh, department, again, for the total of $494 million. Again, just a, a visual breakdown here. Public Works uh, with just over 45%, PD at 21%, and then the rest of, of the uh, different departments. A little more detail on the, the general fund. I'm going to go over both revenues and appropriations. Starting with our revenues, this table sh is showing our revised estimates for the current year, as well as our proposed budget for next year, and the percentages of total of the total for each category, and you can see property tax uh, is the largest uh, revenue source for the general fund followed by sales tax, and then charges for service uh, along with uh, a few other categories trailing. On the property tax side, uh, we are projecting about $77.4 million uh, in total property tax. That, that includes some other categories. When I mentioned secured property taxes are proposed to increase 5%, that's that top line up there, the 39 to $41 million.
This is, again, the uh, secured property taxes. Uh, this is your homes and, and properties uh, showing that 5% increase and going back to 1112, you can see how that component of the property tax uh, revenue has increased uh, over time and, and is anticipated to continue to slowly uh, increase next year. Sales tax, we talked about previously in the volatility associated with sales tax, proposing a, a relatively flat or a flat year-over-year uh, -year projection for revenues, and that's down about 10% or so from our, our actuals dating back to 15, 16. So again, over the last few years, um, a lot of the, the movement in the oil industry has, has really impacted this component of our budget. Again, you can see that drop there, and then from 1617 to 1718, what uh, we're projecting, as well as the actuals for, for prior years. Quickly, some of the other components that make up general fund revenue we have other taxes, so the utility franchise tax, our business license tax, and real property transfer tax make up about $11.1 .1 million. Not a significant increase that we're expecting over the current year revised estimates. Our license and permitting uh, revenue category, again, made up of a few different uh, segments there. Again, not a, not a significant increase. About 1% of the total general fund revenue it comes from this category. Our intergovernmental revenue, again, uh, just a little less than 1% of the general fund revenue comes from this category. Uh, we are seeing uh, somewhat of a, of a decline, but it looks to be because uh, we, we are not receiving a grant that we did in, in prior years, as well as some other reimbursements. Charges for service, uh, again, a slight increase over the current year revised estimates. Fines, forfeits, and assessments, uh, a significant decrease, and I believe this is in part due uh, to some actions at the, the state level and the, the federal level, I believe, in regards to seized asset forfeitures uh, as it relates to pass through to the police department uh, and budgeting associated with that. So uh, that those areas, I think, have dried up somewhat over the last few years due to some changes outside of our control. And then miscellaneous revenue is just kind of everything else, a very small percentage of the, the general fund revenue, slightly down um, from year to, to year. So with the, the, those are the revenue sources. Now I want to talk a little bit about proposed budgets for departments for next year in the general fund. As you can see, staff is proposing bottom line about a 2.79% increase. Small percentage increases on the right-hand side for most departments. Again, that's mostly attributable to CalPERS rate adjustments uh, that are built into department budgets. Otherwise, most operating budgets, as they will show you when they come up here, are, are relatively flat. Uh, the one that may stick out to you is that non-departmental budget. And, and if you recall, in the current year, we made some adjustments to the retiree health care contribution because we were essentially funded at a level where we did not have to make the full contribution. Uh, but still maintain the status of, of the funding in the, in the trust. Uh, so in this case, I believe we're going back now to the, that full payment uh, for the upcoming year. So that's a lot of what makes up that non-departmental difference is really just restoring that, that payment to, to what it needs to be. This gives you an idea, again, by percentage where the general fund dollars are allocated to. Police services and fire services, uh, over 60% of the general fund is, is allocated to these, those two departments. Public works and recreation and parks, um, the, the next two largest, and then goes down from there. This is another way of showing uh, the general fund proposed expenditures for next year. Break it up to personnel cost, operating cost, and, and some other small categories. The, the personnel cost make up the lion's share of the general fund at about 81%. So moving forward, I, and in recap, our sales tax revenues are, are extremely volatile, the volatile, excuse me, a lot due to the oil sector. Our general fund, as you previously saw, is, is uh, pretty stagnant and as far as growth uh, of staff or programs or services. There really isn't much. Those CalPERS costs will continue to rise and will consume general fund funds that are, would otherwise be available for enhancements. 
And again, that state transportation funding that I talked about will help supplement our ongoing efforts and our, our pavement condition uh, here starting in November. Finally, those, the, the federal government, again, will be monitoring them very closely as far as the appropriations process goes uh, to see the status of the CDBG and home programs as well as the COPS program uh, come October or, or shortly after. Uh, Mr. Tandy mentioned it just a moment ago, but here is our, our budget process as we move forward and the dates and we, when we anticipate certain departments coming before you. So uh, Monday we'll, we'll be here at, at noon to talk with uh, a few departments including Visit Bakersfield, AEG, the Finance Department, Police and Fire, as well as the General Government uh, component. June 5th, um, have the City Attorney's Office, Water Resources, Public Works, Community Development, and Recreation and Parks. There's a public hearing that's required each year. That'll take place on June 7th. And then the adoption of the budget is scheduled for June 28th. I have a big asterisk up there because I do know that there has been some interest in uh, some of the council members attending an out-of-town event. Uh, and I, I just wanted to let you all know that we are aware of that and we'll make the adjustments as needed moving forward uh, to make sure there's no conflicts there. I end each year uh, first by telling you uh, how to access the budget uh, or if you get questions about how folks can access the budget. It's pretty easy on the, on the city's website. You just go under how do I. There's a category called learn about and it's right there, city budget. Once you get to that budget page, uh, we have current and archived budget information available. So I'll have this presentation and the book that you received a copy of that available online tomorrow morning. Every time a department comes and presents, so on Monday, uh, the, the Tuesday afterwards, I'll have all the department budget presentations up on that website for review. Uh, and, and the public and others can, can get that information there. And then finally, again, just a recap of the budget team, I do have to thank them because the, we, we meet with the departments and it's, it's time consuming and it's a fruitful uh, process. And, and we're pleased to, to uh, be able to provide you with this proposed budget. So with that, I'll grab a drink of water and, uh, and uh, open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Hewitt. Questions from the council members? Good job, Chris. Very good. Seeing none others, thank you very much. We appreciate uh, your bringing this forward. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Consent calendar items 8A through 8V for approval. Vice Mayor Smith. Thank you. Does any council member wish to recuse themselves from any items? I do have one. Item L1, I, council member Bob Smith, will abstain from that item. I'm uh, abstaining from that item only and will vote on the rest of the consent calendar. Does any council member wish to remove an item for a separate consideration? Seeing none, I will make a motion to approve consent calendar items A through V. You have a motion. Please catch your votes. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you. Madam Clerk, next item, please. Hearings. Before uh, I open the public hearing, I'll go over the presentation time policy. Each side will be allowed 15 minutes. It's 15 minutes for all speakers, so it's important that you identify yourself and make your statement quickly so others may speak. We'll hear statements from those opposed to the staff recommendation. Then we'll hear from those who would like to speak in favor of the staff recommendation. If there's testimonials on both sides, each side will be allowed a 15-minute rebuttal. There's a clock on the wall behind me which indicates 15 minutes. 
Please step to the microphone and identify yourself. After 14 minutes, a yellow light will come on. At the end of 15 minutes, a red light will flash, indicating your time is up, and we would ask that you would quickly end your statement. You may ask questions during your statement, but they won't be answered until the public hearing is closed. If you have written comments that are longer than your verbal statement, please give those to the city clerk, and she'll provide copies to the council. We ask that you be courteous to all the others who wish to speak. Unless there's approval by the majority of the city council, there's a strict 15-minute time limit for all those in favor or in opposition to staff's recommendation. So we ask that you please be concise and avoid repeating the remarks of previous speakers. Madam Clerk, would you uh, please read the item? Budget and Finance Committee report regarding fiscal year 2017-2018 Community Development Block Grant Home Investment Partnerships, Housing Opportunities for Persons with HIV, AIDS, and Emergency Solutions Grant Action Plan Submittal. Thank you. Ms. Kitchen, do you have uh, comments? Thank you, Mayor Goh. Uh, Madam Clerk, would you mind putting up the presentation, please? Uh, thank you. Uh, so this item before your council tonight is the annual update uh, to the city's HUD entitlement funds. Uh, it's the annual action plan. As Mr. Hewat referenced earlier, there is some question uh, out there about the funding amount that will be available for this from the federal government, but we are monitoring and moving forward with our typical annual allocation as is required by HUD. Uh, the purpose of the HUD funding is to complete services and provide services to the community, which are consistent with HUD's mission to create strong, sustainable, inclusive communities and quality, affordable housing for all. The, there are four sources of funding that, com that make up the HUD allocation, and those are the CDBG funds that were referenced earlier, as well as home funds, emergency solution grant funds, and HOPWA funds. And in order to receive these funds each year, the city is required to adopt a five-year consolidated plan. And what that is is a strategic plan that reviews the housing and community development needs of our community and sets several priorities that are to be taken into account for future funding years. And those are listed here. And those are to provide decent and affordable housing, invest in economic and community development, provide infrastructure improvements in low and moderate income areas, and provide public services and facilities. And the CON plan was recently approved by your council in 2014, and we're currently in the third year of the funding cycle. Uh, moving forward, we are projecting an allocation that is the same as last year's for a total of five million, roughly $5 million, broken down as shown here on the chart with roughly $3.2 million going to CDPG and the rest dispersed between the remaining three funds. We've listed the milestone dates uh, before you. This process began back in October of last year when we accepted applications from nonprofits and others who were seeking these entitlement funds. The city did receive over 31 applications totaling about 8.4 million in funding requested. As you can see, that's an exceedance of what our typical allocation is. So we've gone through the typical process as required by HUD. And that started in March uh, with a presentation to the Budget and Finance Committee. And they unanimously recommended approval of the budget as proposed by staff. Since then, we've circulated the action plan for 30 days as required. And we've held two public meetings, one planning commission workshop and an action plan meeting in April. And tonight, we're here to recommend that your council approve the budget as recommended by the Budget and Finance Committee. And upon that recommendation, we will immediately submit to HUD by the May 15th deadline, which is coming right up. Uh, just to quickly overview what the Budget and Finance Committee recommended, this is a breakdown of where the CDBG funds would go. As you can see, a portion of it would go to the administration of the program and then to repayment of our Section 108 loans. Uh, and here's a little breakdown of what those are. We currently have two that we're repaying for the Aquatic Center uh, and the Southeast Street improvements. And there is also a set allocation for fair housing services to the, in the amount of $100,000. 
And this shows the other projects that we were able to recommend by, for funding. As indicated by Mr. Hewatt earlier, there is $300,000 allocated for three sworn police officers that would serve in both wards one and two. And those maps have been shown to the budget committee and they are included in this presentation as well. And it does show areas that are in the downtown area as well as ward one. Uh, the Baker Street area could also be included within that boundary because it is in an income qualifying area. And these are a listing of the projects that we were not able to fund this year uh, due to a variety of reasons, but we will work with each of these users to see if funding can be achieved in future years. This map, it's a little busy, but I think it kind of shows a good snapshot of where this money is going and what it's doing. All of the cross-hatched areas shown here are where curb gutter and sidewalk improvements will be completed with CDBG funds. And then the other uh, red areas on that map show where the other projects are located. And what that CDBG money does is it provides important curb gutter and sidewalk to areas that don't currently have it. This, these photos show some of the before and after photos of what's been done. Uh, it's able to continue sidewalks and ensure pedestrian safety in existing neighborhoods and improve existing curb and gutter scenarios that aren't, uh, that aren't draining effectively. So just a quick overview of the areas where these funds will go. The first is the Union and Brundage area, and that's phase four of an existing project. So we're continuing the effort and leveraging the past work that we've done with the next year's allocation. The next is Baker Street in the Old Town Kern area in Ward 2. That'll be a new project to provide services to that area. The La France and El Toro area is also a continuation of past work in Ward 1 as is the Oleander area project, which is a continuation of past work in Ward 2. In addition to that, we're able to provide funding for the upgrade of playground shade structures for two parks. The first one is the Stern Park, and that is located um, just south of Pacheco Road and north of Fairview. The second is the Lowell Park that is located on P Street and 4th. Additionally, as I already indicated, we'll be able to fund the BPD officers and also continue funding the Bakersfield Senior Center as we've done in the past and provide funding for the home access improvements, which are $3,500 grants that are available to uh, disabled or handicapped persons to add grab bars or other amenities to their homes to make it easier for them to access uh, various amenities within their homes. In addition to that, we have the home program allocation as shown as broken down here. Uh, what we will do with this is in the future, we'll bring forward amendments to the action plan to show the specific projects where those funds will be allocated. The ESG solutions grant is similar to last year with funding to the four uh, agencies shown there. That's Flood, Bakersfield Homeless Center, Bakersfield Rescue Mission, and the Alliance Against Family Violence for their services. And this map shows the location of where those service providers are located. And then finally, the Housing for Opportunities for Persons with AIDS grant is money that is allocated to the city. And we pass that through to the Kern County Public Health Department and they administer that program on our behalf. Uh, so that concludes my presentation. And again, here's the map that shows where the funds are going. And it is our recommendation that your council accept the report and authorize staff to execute all the documents to submit this plan to HUD. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kitchen. At this time, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to speak in opposition? If so, please come to the microphone, identify yourself, and proceed. Uh, good evening, Council Members and Madam Mayor. My name is Chuck Jaley. I'm with Mission Community Services Corporation. We are a nonprofit organization and we help with economic development. We're here to help you with that part of your general, your consolidated plan. And we were fortunate to receive a $25,000 grant in last year's CDBG budget. And you may ask, what have we done with it? Well, I'm pleased to say uh, we're only halfway through with the reporting of it, but we've already helped start create 16 new businesses within the city limits, as well as 33 new jobs within the city limits. And what, you know, your grant has allowed us to add two new classes to what we normally do. And we teach business startup classes. We also 
offer consulting, we have workshops, lunch and learns. We, we try to teach a new business owner everything they need to be successful. And uh, you may also ask, well, does your money go to overhead or does it go to pro programming? It goes directly toward programming. We're partially funded by the Small Business Administration. We get a, a, a grant each year from them. And your funds are used as cash match. So any overhead is taken from the SBA funds. And the best part is you, if you give, you know, grant us another 25000 that gets doubled. So there's $50,000 of services you'll receive for this. Um, and who do we serve? We serve, serve the low and moderate income market. We serve the people that are underserved, the people, most of them uh, do not have the opportunity to go to college. You know, in Bakersfield, I think it's 28% of people do not have a high school diploma. So those are people we're serving. Um, and we, in this county, we're serving mostly the Hispanic market. 85% of our um, students are Hispanic and they don't have the route to college. Uh, you know, that other people may have. So this is the only place they may get the education they've seen. Um, and at this point, oh, and the other thing we do is by creating jobs, we help your, your tax revenue grow. So, you know, through new businesses. And I don't want to take too much time. We've got three other speakers, but we're all going to stay under our time allotment. So it's late. We don't want to go over that. Um, but just uh, our plea at this point is if you can find some budget money, shift it over for another CDBG grant, or perhaps there's some al unallocated funds you have available from prior years that you could give us, or maybe there's some general fund dollars. You know, at this point, um, 25,000 is great, but will we be able to use 10,000 for more classes? You bet. So please help us however you can. I'd like to introduce our other speakers. We have uh, our instructors, Jesse and Clarita Portillo, they teach in Spanish, and we also have a, one of our success stories, Gabriela, with us, and she's opened up a candy distribution business, and she speaks Spanish, so Jesse will uh, interpret for her. But in keeping with the spirit of things, we have a few gifts we'd like to give. So at this point, uh, we have some candy and treats from Gabriela's store, and we're, I believe we give that to the assistant city clerk, is that correct, and she can distribute them? Uh, so please accept them and, and just in spirit of what you've done to help us in the past year. And at this point, I'll introduce Clarita Portillo to come and say a few words. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Clarita Portillo. Uh, I am instructor and also support um, the women. So I'm speaking for every woman in this beautiful city that we work. Um, I think being a, a minority, I see a lot of women not uh, becoming uh, business owners because they don't have access to go to college or finish high school. Speaking from the, for them, what I can say is that we have the opportunity. It's 10 weeks for these classes that they can um, create their, their future for their kids, for, for them, and also to support them not to, to fail in high school. Because as you know, as Hispanics, we have the, we're the majority in that problem. So how can we support them? Support them, their mothers, to create their future so they can see that they can do it and also their kids can do it. I would like to um, introduce Gabriela. She's one of our students. She's our, our success, one of our success story. So I would like to, Gabriela, and Jesse is going to introduce her also. She start the class, the 10 weeks class. In the fifth class, she says, I'm ready. With five bucks in her purse, she start her business. Last year, she created more than a million dollars in revenue. So here's Gabriela. Buenas tardes. Good evening. Mi nombre es Gabriela Murguía. My name is Gabriela Munguía. Les doy las gracias por dejarme compartir un poquito de mi experiencia. I would like to thank you for the opportunity to share my experience. Hace cuatro años. Four years ago. Tomé unas clases que MCSC ofrece a la comunidad. Four years ago, I took a class that MCSU offers to our community. 
Ahí obtuve la información necesaria para poner mi propio negocio. There I found the necessary information to uh, start my business. Ellos me orientaron a dónde tenía que ir por primera vez, dónde tenía que registrar mi negocio. They taught me where to go, where to register my business. Un año después se hizo corporación. A year later I become a corporation. La cual ahora cuenta con tres DBA. Uh, from now it uh, divides in three DBAs. Una de las cuales está aquí en la ciudad de Bakersfield. One of them is here in the city of Bakersfield. Es la más grande. Is the biggest one. Está en un área aproximada de 6,800 pies cuadrados. It's about 6,000 square feet uh, property. Ahí pueden encontrar una gran variedad de dulces mexicanos. You can find a large variety of uh, Mexican candies y varios uh, productos, botanas, uh, chips mexicanos, casi el 100% de nuestros productos son mexicanos. And uh, a variety of snacks that uh, products are coming 100% from uh, Mexico. Piñatas. Piñatas. Party supply. <laughs> Etcétera, ¿verdad? <laughs> Únicamente quiero compartirles que gracias a la orientación que me dio en CSC. Uh, I just want to say that thank you for the orientation that MCSC has uh, uh, brought to me. Ahora, pues yo con mis tres hijos que son muy trabajadores, tenemos lo que tenemos. Now with the three beautiful kids that they are really hard workers, we have what we have created so far. Nos encanta trabajar en esto y poderles ofrecer el dulce sabor de México. We love to work and offer you the sweet uh, taste of Mexico. Gracias por la oportunidad que me dan de estar aquí y espero verlos en su negocio. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to talk here and hopefully you can stop by our business. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak in opposition? Yes, uh, my name is Jesse Portillo. I am an instructor, also a consultant for uh, MCSE and Women's Business Center. You know, I am delighted to present this uh, amazing program uh, to you, councilmen uh, and uh, mayor, uh, vice mayor, uh, because this works for the city. We love our city. We want to uh, make our city successful. Uh, we want, uh, you know, as you might hear, 69% of the business in California have reported that fails in the first two years. And we are working hard on our vision is to change that number because 80% of those businesses are Hispanics. And that's why we are working for those underserved uh, people that as my colleagues have talked. And because we believe in Bakersfield, we believe that we can create a sustainable system that uh, can create a good uh, impact in our economy. And those classes are bringing this. I hope you consider uh, supporting uh, this type of uh, programs that will allow us to continue helping our people, helping our small businesses, because our vision is to change our 80% of uh, those failing businesses to 80% successful stories, as uh, uh, we presented uh, our friend, uh, uh, that she, as a matter of fact, last year won uh, uh, in uh, Kern County recognition as the, uh, the best woman-owned business in, in Kern County. So, I appreciate your time, and uh, I don't know if something else that you want to add. Thank you for your time, and hopefully you consider uh, this type of programs. And uh, we love to continue working hard for uh, in many different ways with our city. And it's a privilege to present you this type of uh, programs that uh, could help our economy. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else in opposition? Seeing none, anybody? who wishes to speak in favor, in support of Steph's recommendation. Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing and return it to the council for comment and action.
I would move staff's recommendation. Give a motion, please cast your votes. Motion is unanimously approved. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Next item, please. Council and Mayor statements. Thank you. Any council members who wish to make a statement? Council Member Parlier. I'll keep it brief because I know the city manager wants to get to his hockey game, so. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to thank the police department. I was looking over some statistics for the special enforcement unit compared to 2015-2016. To date, they have double the seizure in one year this year of uh, guns they've taken off the street. And, uh, you know, reducing gang violence is extremely important to this community. And again, I just want to thank the police department for their efforts. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Weir. Thank you, Mayor. Um, just like to make a note that um, last week I was uh, representing the city as, as well as I could in uh, Busan City in Korea. It went. Uh, it was an awesome trip. It was it was quite a rewarding trip. Met lots of good people and uh, received a couple gifts. One of which was a business card. And I know the people up here on the dais have a business card. The front side is our normal standard City of Bakersfield business card. The back side is, uh, well, it's been jazzed up a little bit just for a Korean business card. And on the back, it has a caricature of me. They're very, very big in anim animation in uh, Buchan City, South Korea. And I have a cute little story. Um, the interpreter on the trip was a very, very petite young lady, I don't know her age, but uh, her and I got to be pretty good friends and we would banter back and forth and uh, I'd tease her and she'd tease me back and it, it was really a, a sweet relationship and uh, we're sitting at the, at the table and we're having lunch and I believe it was uh, the chairman of the city council which represents all 900,000 people in, in, in Bouchon City. city and, we're talking back and forth, and, and somebody at the, at the desk asked if they could have one of my business cards. And I said, sure. In fact, I've got some new business cards. I'll, I'll give you one of my new business cards. And then a couple other people asked, and I said, well, sure, you can have a business card. I think I'll start using these instead of the other ones. I'll just use these business cards. And, and I can see the interpreter sitting there, and she's looking at the business card. And, and she didn't have a bantering kind of face on. She was very serious. And, a few minutes later, I, I hear, you know, well, before that, I said, you know, I'll, I'll use these and maybe it'll, it'll be good for my business. It'll attract more people. More people will come in and, and that would be good for my business. And, and she, she replies by saying, you know, um, when they come in and meet you, won't they be disappointed because you're not so young and handsome? <laughs> now, since we were bantering, I figured I lost this round and I just didn't say anything else. So anyway, if you get a chance to be in a, a sister city program, uh, you will find you will have the time of your life, and I highly encourage it. Good night, everybody. Thank you, Council Member Weir. Thank you for being such a wonderful ambassador and representing us so well. Vice Mayor Smith. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, employee Appreciation Week is this week, and, and I just want to take a moment to uh, express the appreciation for city staff throughout the year and and I think always the city of Bakersfield is served well by uh, all the employees uh, we do more for less in Bakersfield than uh, anywhere else I believe and so uh, as vice mayor greatly appreciate the staff for the city of Bakersfield thank you Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, Mayor Go. I just wanted to make the same point that uh, Vice Mayor Smith made and just giving a big hoorah to all of our city employees who do a wonderful job day in and day out. Um, and I also wanted just to make a quick note and thank all the folks from uh, MCSC Women's Business Center. Um, it was wonderful to hear all the testimonials. Certainly, you know, with a finite amount of resources, it's difficult to make these decisions. Uh, for us, um, it's certainly on the Budget and Finance Committee, very difficult for us to, to balance our priorities. Um, 
but I do want to commend you for all of your work and thank you for your service to our, to our community. And I'm hoping that we can partner in the future, however that makes sense. So thank you. Thank you to all of you who have come tonight. Thank you to our public employees. I'll see you all there at 6 a.m. on Friday. I think that's when it starts and we're serving breakfast. Thank you all. Enjoy your hockey game there. And seeing none uh, other, no other business, we stand adjourned at 6.54. <laughs>